Our next speaker is Dr. J.D. Baines. He's a professor of physiology and pharmacology at the University of Calgary. He's also a member of the Hotchkiss Brain Institute. His research is an effort to understand how the brain processes, remembers, and adapts to stress. Recently, his lab has discovered a surprising, startling mechanism through which stress can be transmitted to others. Dr. Baines. Thanks, Jay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's really a, a delight to be here. Um, I'm going to um, just follow up a little bit on what Dr. Lupian talked about. Um, and she gave you a lot of great insights on how stress affects you. But what I want to talk about is something that Jay just mentioned. Uh, it's a little bit different. And that is talking about how your stress affects those around you and in turn, how their stress is affecting you. So there's two ideas I'd like to discuss. Um, and, and just at the outside, as you think about these ideas, they're a little bit unnerving. So the first idea is, is stress contagious? And if the answer to this question is yes, then the second uh, thing I'd like to talk about is, how does it transmit from one individual to another? Okay, the first part, is stress contagious? I think intuitively, um, we all sense that it is. When others around us are stressed, we sense this. And in turn, their stress makes us stressed. I think we've all felt this. But we've also felt the flip side. When we're stressed, having others around us can help us feel better, right? So this is a, a little bit of a conundrum that we, that we in my lab and a number of other labs around the world have been thinking about quite a bit. So one of the things that helps us understand this conundrum and how it works is the realization that these are not uniquely human conditions. So stress generates in us a, a negative emotion or a negative emotional states. Uh, these emotions though are just external reflections of a negative or positive internal state. So in other organisms, what we call a negative or positive affect, okay? And these affective states have been around uh, in organisms and have existed uh, far before any human-like individuals roam the earth. And knowing about these states allows us to begin to study the transmission of stress. And so what we've learned uh, along with you know, uh, our work, work from many other scientists around the world, is that many organisms from fish to ants to mice to dogs and cats to us are able to transmit their internal states, their emotions to others. So to understand how this happens and why this happens, it's important to understand that, that all of these organisms that I talked about are very social creatures. And being social has a lot of advantages, of course. It allows you to share information about resources. It allows you to share information about dangers, right? That's why social groupings evolved. But as part of the evolution of those social groupings, signals also evolved that allowed us to transmit information about things like danger to others, okay? And so others, without having to be exposed to the danger, started to detect signals from us. And so in, in humans uh, and in many other uh, organisms, the way that we transmit information about stress or the danger or threat that we feel that Dr. Lupian alluded to is in a couple, is in a few ways. One are cues that are associated with, with, with stress. So for example, the pitch of your voice might change, how quickly you walk or pace a room might be a little bit different, you might sigh. So these are all cues, but they're not necessarily tied explicitly to stress. The other thing um, that we think about are stress signals. So these are biologically conserved signals that have been around for hundreds of millions of years. And these signals seem to increase when we're stressed. One of the signals that's been best studied are alarm pheromones. So these are signals that we basically ooze out of us and many organisms ooze out of them. And these alarm signals or pheromones are detected by others around you. But here's the really interesting part. Although others can detect these signals, 
they're not consciously aware. So the, the cortex, the part of your brain that does all the kind of heavy lifting and interacting of the world and helping us figure things out, the cortex is not necessarily aware that you're sensing these signals. But other parts of the brain, the hypothalamus, where the stress center that Dr. Lupien talked about is located, those regions of the brain are very sensitive to these stress pheromones that are released by others. And those areas turn on very quickly. In fact, in our experiments that we've done in the lab, this is using mice as a model system for the things that we study. What we've shown is the changes in brain that occur following stress. Actually, those exact same changes happen in individuals that were not themselves stressed, but just interacted with stressed individuals. And so not only does stress transmit, but the consequences of stress on the brain of a stress recipient are really not that different from the effects of stress on the individual exposed to the stress. So it's, you know, not all doom and gloom. There's a, there's kind of a benefit to transmitting stress and to having social groups. And one of the benefits that we've uncovered, and I think uh, if many of you think about it, you'll understand and, and feel uh, that there's some truth to this idea. One of the benefits is that transmitting stress or interacting with others in a social group when you are stressed is actually beneficial for you. So we were able to show in the lab that interacting with others in a social group helped to erase or buffer the effects of stress in the individual that was stressed. But the really interesting um, and fascinating part of this is that we only saw this in females. So there's lots of ideas around why this might be so sex specific, why, why social groupings of females might buffer the effects of stress in an individual better than males, and, and we, can, we can discuss it later. Um, but, I, but I think when I, when I speak to my friends uh, and my family members and I, and I tell them that we've uh, discovered this, everyone kind of nods their head because we intuitively have this idea in our society that, uh, that, that, that women are very good at sharing and kind of dissipating the stress. Uh, whereas men seem to kind of hold on uh, to the stress in, in a very different way. Um, and, and what we're doing right now is trying to explore the biological mechanisms uh, for why uh, this might be the case.